Hello, everyone, and welcome to the episode, I believe it's five or four or five, um, of Summer Tomato Live. Summer, to Summer Tomato Live is your interactive online classroom where I tell you all you need to know about the food and health topics that you vote are the most important. I'm your host, Daria Pino, creator of the website Summer Tomato, where you can find even more healthy eating tips for food lovers. Summer Tomato is also where you can go to find any show notes and links that I mentioned during the episode once it's released. Today we'll be talking about how to eat healthy as a vegetarian or vegan, which you guys voted as a topic you wanted me to cover this week. I learned a lot researching this topic, and I think it will be really interesting and, and informative for everyone watching, even if you don't happen to be a veggie. And I'm sure you guys are going to have a lot of questions when I finish. So if you're watching live, feel free to ask me questions about anything you're curious about on the topic. Just use a little ask a question button up there in the corner, and I'll get to the questions at the end of the show. And of course, if you want to have a back and forth chat with me, with me, which I would love, call in with your video questions after the presentation. But please remember to wear headphones, these guys, because otherwise there is unbearable feedback between the computers and, and you will make everyone miserable. So if you're going to call in, I don't have a moderator today to check, so just please make sure you wear the headphones. It's really important. And what else? So if you are not watching live but, but uh, want to participate in future episodes, you can sign up at tinyletter.com slash summertomato, which is the URL at the bottom of the screen, and sign up there. The next live show I've scheduled for Monday, April 11th at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and the topic will be, as you guys voted, dairy, friend or foe. And this is a really interesting topic because the data is all over the place and riddled with politics. So I really look, look forward to covering this, and it should be really interesting. There's a lot of heated debate on both sides of the subject, and some people think dairy will kill you, and some people think it's a saving grace. So that'll be a great show. But let's get started on today's topic, which is healthy vegetarian and vegan diets. So there are a lot of reasons to be vegetarian, and anybody who tells you that's not true is very close-minded because nutrition is one thing, but there, so the agriculture industry in general is horrible for the environment. Any industrial farm, uh, especially the cows, so the, I guess the cows and, in, and agriculture in general releases more greenhouse gases than the entire transportation industry, which is insane. And the use of fossil fuels as fertilizer and you know, they basically use petroleum-based fertilizers and chemical fertilizers. That's bad. It's, it's horrible for the land that the all the cows and livestock are on. There's this pro there's a major problem now with ana like superbugs that are created because basically the, the conditions are so unsanitary and so disgusting in the feedlots that they have to pump them full of antibiotics so that they're not constantly sick. And then what happens is you have these like cesspools of antibiotics and you they they've been creating these like super resistant antibiotics that are resistant to everything. They're calling them superbugs. And this is really scary. This affects not just vegetarians. This affects anybody who ever has to go to a hospital. And that's like pretty much everyone. So it, it's, it's a very, that to me is like probably one of the most scary things going on right now because of industrial agriculture. Uh, we also have a horrible soil depletion epidemic going on and soil erosion. The nasty cow sludge toxic runoff is polluting water, polluting soil. It's completely disgusting. If you've ever driven down the 5 freeway and just you can smell it from miles away and it's absolutely disgusting. Everybody rolls up their windows and like turns on the internal circulator. It's it's completely horrifying. And then in the fishing world, I mean, we're almost completely out of fish. Like our oceans are being completely ravaged and no one seems to care. It's it's really really sad. So there are and those are just the environmental issues <laughs> associated with eating animals, and they're all horrifying, and those are all really good reasons to avoid eating meat. There's also a lot of ethical reasons. I mean, as I described, the food lot, the feedlots that cows are in, the chickens, the chicken coops that they keep them in stacked up on top of each other, pecking each other's beaks off, uh, that none of that is, would any of us like our pets to be in, and these are animals that deserve to be treated well also. They force feed animals. They are, they, cows were never meant to eat corn or soy. They're supposed to be eating grass and force feeding the animals these unnatural diets is what causes all the bloating and all the methane. It's uncomfortable for them. It's unnatural for them. And there and generally there's disrespect for animals. They they act as if, you know, the factory farms act as if they're 
a commodity and not a living being. And, and all of those are very good reasons to not want to eat that food. And then some people just don't like meat. They think it, they don't like the taste. And that's fine too. Everybody has their own taste. And so no matter what anybody tells you, besides nutrition, those are all really, really good reasons to consider a vegetarian or a vegan diet. I have to say that I, as someone who isn't a vegetarian or vegan, I think about these things a lot and I care about these issues a lot. And I am very lucky that I live in San Francisco and I can get around a lot of the ethical issues and a lot of the environmental issues because I have access to amazing farms here. So I've seen pictures and visited farms where there are very happy cows eating a natural diet in a healthy ecosystem that's not destroying the planet. It's very sustainable. And you know, if you're lucky enough that that's an option, that's wonderful. But not everybody has access to that. And even if you do can get the food that way, it's really expensive. And I, I'm not going to tell you it's not. I mean, a dozen eggs can be $6, $8 even. Meat can be get really expensive if you take those options. And even organic milk and all that sort of thing. So there are ways around it, but they're not available to everyone. So... And, and, and seafood is another another completely different issue that's difficult. So, if th- those are the, all the reasons that I think are fantastic to consider vegetarianism, and they're good ones. So let's talk a little bit about the some of the myths that are associated with being vegetarian because people come to me all the time with things that just aren't true. So let's just get over this stuff. So one of the myths is that it's healthier <laughs> because there's less saturated fat. And that's not true. Um, you can be totally healthy eating meat and saturated fat has, I, the data is is very interesting. And, and the science is really confusing because pretty much the last like 40, 50 years of science have been skewed toward the fat is bad, saturated fat is bad hypothesis. So people were looking at it in the science before it's even there. But if you sort of remove that idea from your brain and then you go back and reread those studies, you start to see that saturated fat isn't really correlated with heart disease. And I can send, uh, someone was asking me, oh, Tracy was asking me for proof. I can give you uh, some links to some actual science that has shown that it's done meta-analysis that saturated fat just isn't you know, the smoking gun isn't there. Uh, another common myth for vegetarianism is that it's really hard or impossible to get enough protein. Like I said earlier at the beginning of the show, almost everyone that asked me about this in emails beforehand asked about protein, complete protein, how do I get enough protein? And it's very easy to get enough protein. This is the least of your problems if uh, you're considering a vegetarian diet. Uh, another myth is that you don't get as much food poisoning. Um, that's not true. Peanut butter spinach, peppers, all these things have been contaminated. Even organic ones can give you can give you food poisoning. So don't think you're safe from food poisoning just by going vegetarian. Another rumor and myth of being vegetarian is that it's not healthy. So I know a lot of people that feel very strongly. I mean, I had a friend today that was posted a blog post about how vegans are killing their babies. And it happened. It's something and we'll discuss how this happens, but it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to kill your baby if you're a vegan. You can do it healthy. And so that's another myth. And another myth is that it's impossible to train or build muscle and build strength training or endurance training if you're a vegetarian or vegan. And that's just not true either. There have been not a lot, but plenty of examples of elite athletes who kill it in their vegetarian and vegan. I mean, they have a very, very, very rigorous regimen that they stick to and and you have to but it's possible so um okay so so that brings us sort of to the benefits of being vegetarian so one is it's eco-friendly which is it's hard to deny that generally especially if you're not eating so much from the monocultures if you're not eating a lot of soy or corn um, a lot of junk food it's also pretty cheap Kind of. Um, Meat is expensive. Dairy is expensive. The eggs I buy are really expensive. And 
you know, beans, lentils, kale, rice, these things are cheap. Even what's cool, what's crazy is it's cheap even if you buy the expensive stuff. So even if you're, you know, you get the heirloom beans, you guys got the samples, which I hope you enjoy, of the Zersun beans. If you went on their website, you can see that the beans aren't exactly cheap, but they're amazing and I think they're worth it. But it still ends up coming down to just a couple dollars a meal for vegetarian dishes. And you can spend more on fancy salts or on fancy olive oils if you want. But generally, it's a pretty economical way to go. And also, also it can be more ethical. As we've discussed, you're not eating animals. Uh, you might not be doing as much damage to the environment. But it's not necessarily more ethical. And I think that's an important point as well. So what I learned while researching this topic is so I, so I, I, I sort of went on the assumption that vegetarians are healthy. And in a lot of ways, that's true. But what I learned while I was researching this is that the health, the st a lot of the studies that show that vegetarianism is healthier, it's not because of vegetarianism, it's because vegetarians tend to be more health conscious. So vegetarians tend to eat less junk food, they tend to exercise more, they tend to be younger, which also tends to make you healthier. <laughs> And they tend, you know, they just have healthier habits. And actually, if you go and compare healthy omnivores to healthy vegetarians, the, the, there's not a lot of difference. And actually, so a lot of the information, so I went and read this book, and I linked to it in the show notes. Well, the book is called Becoming Vegetarian by who's Brenda Davis and someone else. And... It's, it's supposed to be, it's the, it's on Amazon, it's the number one most popular book for healthy vegetarian diet. And so, I, you know, I sort of started there. And if you want to see my notes, I read it in my Kindle and I left notes in my Kindle and highlights and all that. I'm going to be largely talking about stuff that was in that book, although I did go and do a lot of my own research because I felt the book was really actually very poorly done. But um, you will get a lot of information if, you, if you're interested in this. I, I took a screenshot PDF and stuck it on on the site. So if you want to go back through any of these points later, if you are vegetarian and you don't, if, if I'm talking like, and you don't really know what I'm talking about and you want to go back and re review all this stuff, that's a great place to go. The, Tracy just asked, where do we find the show notes? So the blog posts that you're watching this in, they're, they're just, if you just scroll down a little bit, it says show notes and there's links to, there's probably like 15 links or something that I, those are what I'm talking about. So <laughs> no problem. Um, where was I? We were talking about... Oh, right, the book. So I don't necessarily recommend that book, but it, it was an interesting place to start. And what I was surprised to find is that it's a little bit harder to be vegetarian and healthy, and even more so if you're vegan, if than I thought. I, I expected it to sort of take care of itself with a healthy diet, and it does, but there are pretty serious consequences of missing certain food groups that you don't get if you're an omnivore. And I want to go through the most important ones of those for you guys so that you, you just so that we're all on the same page. <clears throat> so it sounds to me, it seemed to me through the reading that by far the biggest issue for vegetarians is going to be vitamin B12 deficiency. So vitamin B12 is obviously essential. That's what the word vitamin means. And um, it is only found in animal products. And it is found in eggs, dairy. So if you're a lacto-ovo vegetarian, you eat, do eat milk and eggs. Make sure you do. <laughs> Make sure you continue to eat those. If you're vegan, you are pretty much dependent on supplements for this. And... But it, it's really important that you get regular vitamin B12. And if you don't, um, you will start seeing the, the, the symptoms are fatigue and weakness. And I don't know about you guys, but I know a lot of vegetarians that this fits the description of how they are. They're very tired. Um, but it can, and you can resolve a lot of these issues by introducing B12 into the diet. And a regular supplement can do this. So you want about 10, I think, micrograms a day. But if you let it go and you go vitamin B12 deficiency for too long, you'll start to lose sensation in your fingers. You'll get numbness and weakness. You, will, you can develop depression, severe depression, 
a, you can get a lot of neural damage. You can, it makes you more susceptible to all sorts of neurological problems, and it's irreversible. So it's essential that if you are a vegetarian or vegan, that you're getting a regular dosage of vitamin B12. And if you're not sure if you're deficient or not, you can get a blood test. So you can just go ask your doctor for a blood test. And good sources, okay, so and and there okay, so I guess also a lot of vegetarians falsely assume that they can get vitamin B12 from vegetarian sources. But that apparently is not true. And this is a quote directly from that book. None of the following should be relied on as B12 sources. Fermented foods such as miso, tempeh, tamari, sauerkraut, and umabushi plums, sea vegetables, spirulina, which I thought that um, I had heard that spirulina could get you your vitamin B12, but apparently it can't. Algae, raw plant foods at all, or unfortified plant foods. You can only get it from meat, eggs, dairy, or supplements. So I hope everybody's clear on that and that you're all getting sufficient B12. And if you have any fatigue or anything, you might need more. So you, it's probably worth getting tested or at least experimenting with getting more in your diet. So the next major nutrient that vegetarians tend to be lacking is, and, and, and this goes for vegan, for everything that I say where vegetarians might be lacking it, vegans are worse because some of this stuff will be in eggs and dairy and vegetarians might not eat a lot of eggs and dairy. No, vegans eat zero. So th these things are even more important for, for vegans. But uh, so the next big nutrient is omega-3 fatty acids and specifically EPA, which is one kind of omega-3 fatty acids. And if you're, you are vegetarian or vegan and you don't know the different kinds of omega-3 essential fatty acids, you should go do research on this and go read about it a little bit yourself. So there's ALA, which is alpha-linolenic acid. Um, when that is in plants, you can get that from plants. And then there is DHA and e EPA. And those are from animals. And a lot of sources will tell you, including this book, and it was wrong on this point, which makes me angry. A lot of sources will tell you that, oh, don't worry, your body can convert ALA to DHA and EPA. And this is true, but it does it at a very, very inefficient rate. So in order to get enough for your body to produce enough EPA to prevent all these things I'm going to tell you that you can get if you don't have enough, which is terrifying, you really need to be eating a lot. And I actually would recommend, and I, you know, not everybody's going to be comfortable with this, but I would actually recommend taking a supplement that's based on fish oil. And I know that's not entirely vegetarian, but I don't, I don't see a way around this, quite honestly, and I really wish I had a better answer for you. You can try to load up on ALA and hope for the best. Hope that this book writer is correct, that you can convert it at a high enough rate to give you the EPA you need to prevent depression, Alzheimer's disease, schizophrenia, ADHD, cognitive impairment, heart disease, and all these other neurological problems. And we don't even know that that's all of it. You know, depression is a very subtle thing, and you wouldn't necessarily connect it to diet. But it, but it sounds a lot of these deficiencies lead to depression. And if, if depression is an issue for you, you might seriously consider, and, and you happen to be vegetarian or vegan, you might seriously consider adding different supplements or experimenting with different foods to try to actually get over that, which would be great. That's so much better than, you know, living with depression. So it, definitely play around with these things. And like I said, make sure you're aware of the sources of these different foods. So good sources of DHA and EPA include fish, and sort of eggs, but the eggs have to be those high DHA eggs, which have to be from chickens that were fed flax seeds. Sea veggies kind of have some of this stuff, but not in very high quantities. And and you can, and for DHA, you can get a supplement that is vegetarian. It's like a, a microalgae supplement, and that'll work for the DHA. And you need both DHA and EPA and ALA. You need all of them. And generally... You know, I'm saying all these things. It's important that most vegetarians are deficient in these things. There's, we have data for that. So most vegetarians are deficient in vitamin B12, especially vegans. I just read a study the other day that vegans are at increased risk for heart disease because they're lacking in vitamin B12 and omega-3. So somebody asked earlier in the chat if vegans have less heart disease. No, they have more. 
Uh, what else? Uh, sources of a- so if you wanna, if you really, really wanna go full, fully plant diet, and and you feel really strongly about it, and you wanna try to get all the omega threes you can need from ALA, the best sources are gonna be chia, hemp, and flax. And if you get flax seeds, try grind up flax seeds, not whole and not the oil. Also, walnuts, butternut, and soy have to a lesser degree you can get from them. And another problem, so another thing you have to consider when you're thinking about omega-3 fatty acids is it's not just how much omega-3 you get. It's also you want to have a, the right ratio of omega-6 fatty acids, which are also essential to omega-3 fatty acids. And generally, everyone has too many omega-6 fatty acids and too few omega-3 fatty acids, and so the ratio is really far off. Vegetarians are actually worse than omnivores because... They eat so few sources of EPA and DHA. So you really have to work hard to get these ratios in balance. So another thing you can do to help with this ratio is not just eat more DHA and EPA, omega-3s, but also eat less omega-6. So you want to cut out as much as possible uh, sunflower oil, safflower oil, corn oil, grapeseed oil, soy oil, and cottonseed oils. And these are generally the stuff that you find in junk food. So processed foods that are vegetarian, like Twinkies or whatever, are you're going to have this issue. So omega-3s are really, really important. And so is vitamin B12. And, th- and I'm t- speaking generally right now for an average healthy person. But if you're getting pregnant, or if you are pregnant, if you're raising a child on any of these diets, it's way more important. Way more important. I mean, so one of the reasons I I have a friend who's pretty hardcore post about anti-veganism today, it's because babies need so much more B12 than they're getting that they will die. And it happens every year. I read stories about vegan parents feeding their children soy milk and fruit juice, and they die. It's really sad. So don't let that be you. Make sure that if you're pregnant or feeding a baby that there's B12 and omega-3s, lots of them. Moving on. So another general concern about while we're on the topic of fatty acids is generally vegetarians tend to be very low fat. And for a long time this was thought to be good. And I don't think it is. The more I read about fat, dietary fat, the more important I realize it is. Ironically, for heart disease, even, I mean, for years we were told that a low-fat diet is the best way to prevent heart disease. It's totally not true. It will lower your LDL cholesterol, but I, nobody believes me when I say this, but if you go look at the papers, the scientific papers, where people look at measurements of heart disease, you know, because it's... You don't go and like cut somebody's artery open and look at it and be like, yes, this person has heart disease. Usually they measure what we call biomarkers. And these biomarkers are blood cholesterol levels, for example. We don't even use LDL as a measurement of heart disease anymore because it's a horrible one. You can't predict heart disease with LDL levels. What they use is HDL, which is a high-density lipoprotein, which you want to be as high as possible. So they use high HDL as a marker of low heart disease risk. And the other thing they measure is triglycerides, high triglycerides, are probably one of the best predictors of heart disease. So the problem with low-fat diets is that while you do get low cholesterol, low LDL, you also get low HDL, which is really bad. That's a bad thing. And you also get more symptoms of depression, and particularly if you have low omega-3 fats in particular. You get chronic fatigue on low-fat diets. These are not good things. So you want to make sure that if you are vegetarian, that you're getting enough fat. So you really need to focus on all these other sources of, of good quality fats. And that's really important. Um, another thing, and this is not isolated to vegetarians, but vitamin D deficiency is important for everyone. And, but v- vegetarians need to be aware of it as well. And you know, a lot of people assume that calcium is what gives you strong bones. And while you do need calcium to create strong bones, it's vitamin D that really puts it in your bones. So vitamin D deficiency is the best I've, marker I've seen of osteoporosis. Weak bones, if you have any bone degeneration, which I know some vegetarians do. Cancer, and not low vitamin D is associated with a lot of different kinds of cancer. Depression, again. Any autoimmune disease, such as multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, 
di type 1 diabetes, those are all big problems. So you want to make sure you take vitamin D. The only, the, the only sources, there's very few food sources of vitamin D. L livers of oily fish, cod and halibut, vegetarians probably aren't going to eat those. Most omnivores probably aren't going to eat those. So the best sources are sunshine and supplements. I take supplements. I take these little drops, which are nice. I take four. Alternatively, you can also take just a basic D3. Depending on where you live, I take 4,000 IU. I think it's, I mean, it makes your hair and nails grow like crazy, which is awesome. <laughs> and I get sick way less. So I recommend the vitamin D3 supplements for pretty much everyone, vegetarian or not. So problems that are, another problem that's specific to vegetarians and vegans is iron. So you have, it's something you have to consider. Omnivores are all very rarely low in iron. Sometimes women are. But with vegetarian, so there's great sources of iron are in both plants and animals. But in plant, they tend to be these non-heme irons. And if you don't know what I mean, and you are vegetarian, you should know what this means. Please go read about it. Heme iron versus non-heme iron. And the difference is that heme iron is easily absorbed by your body. But non-heme iron, the vegetarian sources of iron, tend to be difficult to absorb. And you need vitamin C really around to do that. And there, I posted a great link in the show notes about from a vegetarian, like it's called Healthy Vegetarian Sources of Protein and Iron. It'll go over all this stuff for you. It's a great resource. But basically vitamin C will help you absorb it. So have, make, try to have vitamin C when you have your iron sources, which I'll tell you what those are in a second. And calcium and tannins tend to block it. So calcium and tannin, calcium, you know what calcium what's in calcium, but tannins are black tea, red wine, chocolate. It's, these tend to block your iron absorption. Another good way to get iron is from cast iron skillets, if you want to cook in a cast iron skillet. But basically your best sources of iron for vegetarians are going to be uh, what they call low oxalate greens, like kale, broccoli, collards, cabbage, and then also beans. There are tons of iron in beans and, and lentils, just tons. So have some lentils, squirt some lemon on there, and you're good. Zinc is another thing to be concerned about. Not, it's not as bad as some of the other ones, but you don't want to be deficient in zinc, and you can be if, you, if, you, if you're like the, a junk food vegetarian. So you have to make sure to get all these things in your diet. So you can get zinc from peas, seeds, and then also meats, eggs, and wheat germ. Not wheat bran, very different. Wheat bran actually blocks it, and asparagus. And another thing you can do to increase the uh, absorption that you get of certain minerals and these vitamins from beans and nuts is you can soak them. And that makes them more, uh, uh, more bioavailable. So look into soaking if you're, if you're concerned about this sort of thing. I, I'm not too worried about calcium. If you're eating lots of rich greens like uh, kale and all those things. There's lots of broccoli. There's lots of calcium in that. If you're just a vegetarian and not vegan, you can get it from milk, obviously. Almonds and sesame tend to both be decent sources of calcium, but generally you're probably going to have to rely on something of a supplement for this. So f any fortified food, but if you're eating, drinking any milk substitutes, which I'll go over at later, then you want to make sure that they're fortified. And don't just assume that they are because they, they're not necessarily going to be. So vitamin A is another issue that it's different forms in vegetarian food and non-vegetarian food. And preformed vitamin A is the kind that you can easily absorb. And once again, it's kind from animals. And you can get pro-vitamin A from vegetable sources and it converts to preformed vitamin A in your body, but again, at a very low efficiency rate. So you need more vitamin A if you're eating vegetarian sources of vitamin A. And you can increase absorption by eating it with fat and with, by cooking it. And these are going to be uh, in, in different, different vegetables are going are to have vitamin A. So just make sure that you're eating a lot of different kinds of vegetables. If you're eating all the different kinds of foods that you can think of that are vegetarian, you're, you're going to be fine in all these things. <laughs> Um, and the only thing is that you don't want to get too much from supplements with vitamin A because you can get poisoned from too much vitamin A supplements, so be careful with that. And generally all the trace minerals 
can be reduced, like you'll reduce absorption of them if you eat too much fiber. So you want to be careful on the fiber, and that's generally going to be your whole grains. So it sound, I always whole grains are good, but that you don't want that to be the bulk of your diet. You don't just want to be eating all fiber. You want to make sure you're getting beans and nuts and all the and like green vegetables and colorful vegetables and all these different things to get every single thing you need because it's. You know, omnivores have the luxury of being able to eat more junk food because the meat is so nutritious. But, you know, if you don't have that luxury, you have to make sure to get everything else. Otherwise, you have to be very dependent on supplements, which don't even work. So I would definitely, definitely recommend sticking to the foods and doing as best you can to get as many different variety of foods as you can. Uh, another, th I'll talk about that later. Yeah, so generally you want to avoid... There's certain things you want to avoid. You want to, you don't want to get too much gluten. I wouldn't recommend so the fake meats, the processed meats. I wouldn't recommend that, and it's because gluten is a, it can it's an inflammatory and it can affect autoimmune issues. So if you have rheumatoid arthritis, for example, or, or you're you might it runs in your family, or you know a lot of people have gluten intolerance. You, you want to avoid those fake meats. Processed grains and sugars, obviously no one should eat these, but, you know, if you, vegetarians can sometimes be worse on this because they get dependent on non-meat foods and they can sort of rely on junk foods and that's not good. And the same thing with hydrogenated oils. These are trans fats. These are horrible for you. Processed soybean oil, hydrogenated soybean oil. Never touch it. It's really bad for you. It's junk food that's available to everyone, but vegans should definitely be, or vegetarians and vegans should definitely be aware that that's something you want to avoid. So generally, you should just focus on having a balanced diet. Make sure you include grains and different kinds of grains. And don't just eat rice all day. Eat rice, oats, barley, quinoa, farro, all of it. Go to the fancy store and look at all the grains and learn how to cook them. Eat as many different greens as you can. Kale, broccoli, lettuce, arugula. Learn them all. Eat them all. Learn to love them all. This is not the time to be picky. An assortment of other kinds of vegetables, peppers, eggplants, artichokes, um, there is carrots, tubers, things that grow on trees, things that grow on the ground. Eat them all. They're all very good for you. Legumes, different kinds. They all do different things. Like black beans do different things than lentils. They do, and then red beans and white beans. Go, go eat all of them. Same thing with nuts. Olive, or almonds tend to be higher in vitamin E and calcium. Brazil nuts are higher in selenium. Play around with all these different things. Make sure you get plenty of fat. So the nuts are important. Olives, olive oil, those are important. Avocado, eat it. It's great for you. Um, if, if you really want to stick with the vegetarian sources of omega-3s, ground flax seeds, hemp, walnuts. I actually recommend you try coconut oil as well. It's a saturated fat, but it's these medium chain fatty acids that are starting to sound like they're important in health. So try cooking in coconut oil as well. Um, I highly recommend eggs if you are vegetarian and you can, and you eat eggs. I think I, I would like that's one of your gold mine sources of nu nutrients right there. I would try to eat those very regularly. And dairy, we'll, we'll talk about dairy next episode. You guys voted that dairy is the topic for next episode. It, it's could be a problem, but if you're not vegan, it it might be a good source of a lot of things for you. And then of course supplements, the most important being vitamin D3 and a multivitamin and mineral. So. But let's talk about protein really quick because a lot of people ask me about protein. So basically there's, if you eat the way I just described, you have all the protein you need. Um, someone asked specifically what does it mean to be a complete protein. So basically proteins are made from molecules called amino acids. And there's 20 amino acids that make up all the proteins in your body on earth. And nine of those are essential, meaning that your body doesn't produce them, so you have to get them from food. And normally this is very easy. If you eat meat, you get all the amino acids. But some foods, all foods have all amino acids, but some foods are tend to be very low in certain amino acids. Specifically, grains tend to be low in lysine, which is one kind of amino acid. And what that means is that even though it might say that there's four grams of protein in a cup of rice or whatever, because there's not a lot of lysine in there, your body needs can only use the amino acids if like all of them are there at once. So that makes lysine like a limiting factor and it makes a lot of the protein not bioavailable. That's the word we use. So it's not available to your body. 
And But what you can do to resolve that is to eat foods that have lysine, and then you can use all that protein on the rice. So luckily, these con so the idea of complementary foods, so beans and nuts, tend to have plenty of lysine. So usually if you eat beans or nuts and rice or grains, you are fine. You have plenty of protein. And hardly and the only people who are protein deficient are like people in very poor environments where they only eat one thing all day. And, and that will really make you protein deficient. Or if you are somebody who just eats cereal and pasta all day and you don't eat beans at all, then you could be protein deficient. But generally, I mean, if you're eating beans and nuts daily, which you should be, I mean, I even do that, I'm not vegetarian, you want, you're not going to be protein deficient. And you should be fine. So that's my advice on protein. And a couple other things I wanted to cover. People, I assume people are going to ask me about milk substitutes. So I'm not a huge, so soy is problematic. There's been a couple, so too much soy has been associated with thyroid problems and also thrown around in some cancer talk, which I don't believe the cancer talk. But basically it's an estrogen mimic. And so, it, you know, there's, you don't want to mess around with too much soy. So I wouldn't rely a lot on soy. And I stopped buying soy milk when I realized half the beans were being imported from China, even the organic ones. And I don't touch food from China because I assume that they're, poisoning us with it. Remember they poisoned baby food once not too long ago. So I linked to a, a podcast by the Nutrition Diva about different milk substitutes. I think it's, I totally agree with her. I recommend um, help hemp milk or almond milk. I think those are the, probably the two best ones. Try to get fortified ones. And the most important decision you can make is get unsweetened, not vanilla, not plain unsweetened. And it, it, it's hard at first to make that transition. I used to drink soy milk and I started with vanilla and it's delicious. It tastes like ice cream. And then I was like, oh, it's a lot of sugar. And I moved to plain and I was like, oh, it's not quite as good, but it's okay. And I got used to it. And then I thought it was the best thing ever. And then I was like, ooh, I really should cut down on the sugar because it's like almost like dessert. And I, tr I went to unsweetened. I was like, eh, it's not as good, but it's okay. And eventually like even the plain is like disgustingly sweet to me, but it's, it was a process. So if you're still at the vanilla stage, you can work your way down. That's fine. But I definitely recommend weaning yourself off the sweetened versions. That's really, it's like a, such a waste to have a big hunk of sugar in your breakfast. It's just no good. And so, and I don't, I think rice milk is pretty useless. It, to me, it's just calories. I, I don't see the point of rice milk. So I, I don't recommend that. There's no real benefit, no protein, no nothing. Um, and finally, I wanted to talk briefly about meat substitutes. So I don't recommend these. I don't, as you guys know, I don't uh, recommend processed foods at all generally. They tend to be really high in gluten, which I said can be inflammatory and problematic for a lot of different reasons. They're highly processed. Tofu is okay, but like I said, soy is one of those things where you know it, it's got questionable value. The fermented ones aren't so bad. Tempeh, for example, probably not so bad. You know, you definitely don't be scared of it in your diet, but don't be like eating it every meal for weeks at a time. That's going to be where your problem is. So that's my take on meat substitutes. I generally just sit, you know, occasional tofu, occasional whatever, but generally stick to the beans and the rice and all that good stuff. And that is it. So let me just check to see if my little friend, I don't see my friend. Okay. Awesome. So that's the show. Please start submitting questions to me <laughs> by asking a question. I have a couple in here already. Oh, and I do have a video question. Sweet. Okay. Yeah, uh, Richard, I saw your question. I'd love to chat with you. <laughs> so let me take this question first, though. Uh, oh, we talked about this, actually. Um, yes, tea can inhibit iron consumption. It's the tannins in the black tea. It's easy to get your iron tested. Go donate blood or go to the doctor and have it tested. You'll know if you're low, and if you are low, you might consider having less black tea. You could switch to green tea. Or you can start eating more iron with the vitamin C, um, and that should help with the absorption. So let me. Um, so my friend that I was telling you about, I think he's here. Uh, Richard, who he had a, the show about... Um, <laughs> the discussion about vegan diets for children and how they were killing their babies, and he wants to have a little discussion with me, I think, about it. So, Richard, I hope you have headphones in, and we will have a discussion. This should be interesting. Oh, let me take this question down. I hope I, hope I answered your question, by the way, Kat. 
You there? Yeah, we'll see if he pops up. And in the meantime, folks. I'm here. Oh, you're there. I'm here. I'm not. I, do you hear me? I hear you. I do not see you. I I don't I don't see uh, I don't see the video, but are we on audio? I believe so. Can everybody else hear Richard, or is it just me? Okay, yeah, they can hear you. Can so hear let's you. do it. <laughs> okay, it does the audio. The video is there if it pops up. But uh, hey, you know, you sent me running back from my patio back here. <laughs> um, I didn't even know when the show was on, but. You know, I tweeted, you did that Enneen thing, and it, you know, it may be a generational gap sort of thing, but I thought it was like this sort of to be an evil looking Daria, and I, and I, I tweeted to you about like, oh, you should register evilsummertomato.com, right. and I got a ba tweet back from you, but I didn't understand, I, I don't know whether you were referring to that, but I'm like, oh my God, she, she took it the wrong way. <laughs> no, so no, 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 no. I came running back here, and I, you, I, I probably, I probably did the the most the most record subscription to your uh, your thing ever. But anyway, um, so anyway, if that was what that was about, no, no, I don't no, know. I was just trying to but, explain uh, to people that. But it, it was. It's, I was just trying to explain to people that um, you you made a very good point actually, which is that it's very important that people that wants to choose a vegetarian or vegan lifestyle, especially vegan, that they are, understand the nutritional consequences of the decisions they're making, especially if they're raising a family. And that's, that's all. I, I, think, I think you made an excellent point. And I, I personally am amused by your um, sort yeah. of ranty uh, banter that you do on your blog, but I know that some people probably would be less yeah. amused by that, especially in this crowd. So, Well, I miss... I, I missed the first part of the show, so I, I gather you referenced it already. So, right. Um, so let me just maybe in out of con total out of context. Hey, I'm drinking white wine too, but you mm. can't see it on the video. <laughs> um, the uh, here's the thing. Uh, the, here's the thing. Wouldn't you agree, Daria, that 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 veganism is totally a modern phenomenon? I mean, that that post I did today is already over a hundred comments. And some of them are actually raw vegans mm -hmm. uh, on there. And and one guy in particular, he's an Indian, formerly lacto vegan mm -hmm. for many many you know traditionally all his life, or lacto vegetarian I should say. And then in the last ten years, vegan. The last five years, raw vegan. And you know, this is a person who understands it very well. And but but yet at the same time, they talk about all of the different fruits and vegetables that they're eating all the time. I, and so my point is that, okay, well, you know, I have a kind of paleo blog. It's about being natural. And a lot of the people in, in both your real food movement and the paleo movement are getting increasingly about local sourcing of meat, fruit, vegetables, right? Mm -hmm. But it seems to me that, that the, 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 the vegans who are increasingly trying to prove that their diet is healthy show that they're eating, they have, to, they have to go to the four corners of the globe, literally, to get all of this right. stuff because they exclude a very important <laughs> macronutrient. Absolutely. I totally agree with that. And, or and not I, a macronutrient or a, a food group. Right. I totally agree with that. And I think that... Go it ahead. is modern, and I think it's a hundred percent. I mean, it's a hundred. To me, it's got to be a hundred percent ethical distinction that is being made, and you know that's not my business. But I just want people to be aware of <laughs> that they need to do all these things that if if they don't want to, you know, kill their babies. Did I lose All you? right, so hey, okay. um, I, I don't want. I want some of your other uh, other folks to, to get in here. So th uh, I'm I'm glad to get a, a second to talk with you, Daria. Yeah, I appreciate I'll, it. Uh, I'll uh, I'll text you one of these days when I'm up at the San Francisco Farmers Market. Nice. And anybody who wants to see Richard's blog and inflammatory Have comments, go to Free the Animal. <laughs> um, thanks, Richard. All right. So all right, that was fun. <laughs> I was I was expecting more inflammation, but we didn't get that here. All right, so here's a question from Aisha. 
So are there potential negative effects of soy observed among Japanese populations that consume so much soy? So this is a really interesting point. So this is why I don't subscribe fully to the soy is bad argument because you're right, Japanese people are super duper healthy. But Japanese people also do a lot of other things. They eat a lot of fermented soy. They eat a lot of fermented foods in general, which have a lot of benefits. I, I hope one day you guys vote for probiotics. I'd love to have that conversation because fermented foods create these probiotic bacteria that really help you digest and help with food and nutrition and, and, and how you absorb it. Um, that being said, you know, Japanese people have more strokes than I believe anyone in the world, too. I, maybe it's from the salt. I don't know, because they tend to eat a lot of... They, I mean, it could, it could be from anything, but... Yeah, so if you... I don't know... I, don't, I haven't seen the data for Japanese and thyroid problems. That would be interesting to find out. I, I'm curious about that. But they definitely don't have more cancer. They have less cancer. So I'm not convinced that soy is dangerous in the cancer realm. I, I th what, my, what my suspicion is, is that some people are sensitive to soy. And my guess is that the Japanese sort of gene pool in general is probably not. But there are some people who are very sensitive to soy and people with thyroid issues or predisposed to thyroid issues. And that, that's something to be concerned about, but not for everyone. So, so there's a comment here. Um, they do eat small portions. That's a good point. So Tracy said they eat very, very small portions in Japan, which is a good, good point. Generally, Americans... Don't know what a small portion looks like. <laughs> so, um, let's see. So, great, great question. And I, I that that's something that I don't think we are resolved everything in the soy front yet. I think there's a lot more to learn still. So, I still eat it. Thanks for the question. We have another one here from Scott WD9. Do I have any thoughts on extra or extra advice on vegetarian diets for runners? Um, there is a great, great description of vegetarian endurance athletes in the book we talked about in episode one, The 4-Hour Body, and I would, I would check that out. It's pretty fascinating. I mean, your biggest issue is going to be calories. Uh, you're, you don't necessarily need more vitamins just because you're running, but you do need more calories. You might need more protein to be doing, to, to get that muscle repair that you're going to need to do from long workouts. I, I'm not sure how, you know, any kind of runner, I guess, whether you're sprinting or doing endurance, you're going to need uh, a, you know, a good, reliable, what's the word? I'm, I'm blanking on the word for when you rebuild your muscles after the workout. Um, Refueling. <laughs> That's it. You're going to need to be do some good refueling. So you're going to make sure you, you have a very good concentrated source of protein and, and, and calories. And to get those calories up, you're probably going to be, need to rely quite a bit on fat. And so I would, you know, I'd use a lot of fat to cook with, the olive oils, the coconut oils. I would, you know, if you're a vegetarian, I would definitely eat eggs and cheese. Those are going to be good sources. So <laughs> cheese is something, if you guys are interested... I'll switch over to the chat. Stop me if I'm boring you. But cheese is something that's really, really interesting to me. I posted a, a link to someone else's blog about vitamin K and heart disease. So there's all these, and this is, you know, this came up a couple times already. There are vitamins that there's different forms of them. And the vegetarian sources are okay, but frequently the animal sources are a lot better. And vitamin K is one of them, vitamin K2 specifically. It tends to be in hard cheeses, and it's, just, it's amazing. They're associated with lower risks of heart disease. It's, it's awesome. I love it. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, it seems like cheese actually, even though everything any health organization's ever told us is that it'll kill you, actually people who eat more of it have reduced heart disease. So, <laughs> But, of course, these are healthy people, you know, not... If you add cheese, if you add American cheese on top of a junk food diet, you're not doing yourself any favors. But real cheese, fermented cheese, um, tends to be high in a, a very specific vitamin that we do, nobody ever talks about vitamin K, or even let alone about the K2 version of vitamin K. But th these are the sorts of this is why nutrition. We're still, I feel like, where physics was like 
you know, back in the turn of the century or where surgery was in like the 1500s or something, you know, just really, really primitive because the body is so complex and everyone's so different and there's so many things going on and foods are so complex and they, then they work together and then you eat them and everybody's, it's just a, it's a mess. But yeah, so I think cheese is a great example for me of how people get it wrong all the time and how you shouldn't believe everything in the media. <laughs> throw that one in there. Um, okay, so great question about runners. So I don't have any more questions in my queue. So what do you guys got for me? We have eight minutes to kill. Anything? Anything? Is there anything else that I wanted to say? Oh, oh, I did want to talk briefly about the China study. So um, I didn't talk that much specifically about vegans, and I, I do want to a little bit because um, – so I've written about it before. My review of the China study is in the show notes. Um, but basically the China study is the book that all vegans usually point to as to why they're healthier than me and why I'm going to get cancer and die. And – I, so Colin Campbell is a respect, respected scientist. <laughs> oh, interesting. Interesting, Tracy. Um, as Tracy just said that she's reading the China study now. So you should read my review. You'll find it interesting. And then go read Denise's analysis, which I linked to in the review. Basically, the China study is a book. <laughs> Only one chapter of it is actually anything being studied in China. That's chapter four. In the beginning, he sets up this research that he was doing in the Philippines where he discovered that these children were getting liver cancer at a very young age, 10, 11 years old. And that's really, really, really rare. And it was weird, and so they were trying to figure it out. And what was more strange was that it was only the rich children that were getting the liver disease that the, the poor children weren't. And after a lot of research, what they discovered is that basically all the kids were eating this contaminated peanut or peanut butter. It was contaminated with what's known as aflatoxin, which is a very dangerous fungus that happens. It happens for peanuts. Like we have pretty good systems now to fix it, but you know we could we could get aflatoxin. But basically, what happens is aflatoxin is a very potent carcinogen, and it causes liver cancer. But what Colin Campbell discovered over in the Philippines or Indonesia, um, I forget which, was that only the rich kids were actually getting the disease because they were drinking milk and the poor kids couldn't afford milk. And the milk is actually a promoter of cancer in this case. So the way cancer works is it's a two, well, it's a multi-stage process, but the first stage is um, the mutagen, so the, the carcinogen that actually causes the mutation that creates the cancer, but then the cancer doesn't spread on its own. It needs a promotion, and, and it usually requires a separate chemical. And in this case, the chemical was a protein in milk called casein. And he does, you know, and in this case, Campbell's entirely right. He went back to the lab. He studied it in rats. Uh, undoubtedly, if you're exposed to the very potent carcinogen aflatoxin, then the protein in milk will cause cancer. He took this piece of data and extrapolated to say that all animal protein causes cancer, which is just not true. <laughs> it's just if all animal protein caused cancer, everyone would die of cancer. It's just not true, um, and and it and it's a horrible, horrible leap of logic. And I that's inexcusable from any scientist, in my opinion. But this China study is. I didn't mention China in that, you might notice. So he, he kind of starts with that premise, like, I already think animal protein is going to kill you. Then he goes and does this huge study in China, which is fascinating, where he gets all this data from 60 different provinces in China or whatever. And then he, you know, collects data, like nutrition data, he takes food samples, and then he studies rates of diseases. And he declares that everybody who lives in rural China is healthier, and people who live in city China are, you know, have the Western disease and that it's a disease of civilization and it's because of all the meat and all the protein that they're getting. So most, ve so a lot of vegans used to say that it's the fat that's bad and that's sort of falling out of fashion, but 
Campbell is saying that it's the meat and it's causing cancer and the animal protein, not just meat. And basically a bunch of people have like redone the analysis and this, this woman, Denise Minninger, Minninger, whatever, I don't know how to say her name. I'm really bad at names. She went and analyzed it and like basically he didn't, it didn't even show what he said it showed. I mean, basically he had to go from like, he had to do jumps from like, well, it, the meat eating was associated with cholesterol and cholesterol was associated with cancer. But meat eating actually wasn't associated with cancer. Like that never was there. But the way he describes it, it makes it sound like that connection then was there, but it wasn't in the data. Um, and so it, it's, I, I don't know how to say this nicely. Basically, it's a load of crap. Like the, the, the China study is a load of crap. My favorite part of the China study is the end of the book when he talks about you know, how medical schools and how uh, the dairy industry and all that stuff is feeding our medical students and teaching them garbage, which is totally true. But uh, his argument that meat causes cancer, I think, is complete hogwash. And every single piece of data I've seen says the exact opposite, that most of us low-fat diets are probably what's causing heart disease. That's why we have way more since, and why we're way fatter and why we have way more diabetes since those guidelines went into effect. We've actually have reduced our fat intake substantially and it's been a real problem. Um, and I just, I don't know how I feel about protein. I'm not, I'm not a fan of processed protein, which someone asked about. Um, like, you know, taking a jar of protein and adding it. I, I don't think that's a good idea. I think if you want more protein, you should eat more protein foods. But I don't think that, yes, it does depend on what the animals have been fed. That's true. So somebody just asked that. But generally, I, I am skeptical that I, – I don't know how I feel about protein. I, like, I'm, I'm, not a, I don't, I'm not a high protein or a low protein advocate. I'm a low carb and generally more fat and good fat advocate. So that's, that's my take on the China study. And I don't know how Campbell can ignore the rest of the evidence – so the thing about the, the thing about veganism, though, it, it does re re reduce heart disease. So just let be clear about this: you can go on a vegan diet, and your rates of heart disease will decline. And the re the reasons for that are many, many. One is you're going to be eating a lot more good food. I mean, I mean, you can eat bad food. You can definitely get more diseases if you're vegan if you only eat Twinkies all day or whatever. But if you change to a healthier diet where you're eating more whole, unprocessed foods, you're going to be healthier. Also, because the vegan diet is so low calorie, people tend to lose weight if, if they're eating a healthy vegan diet. And if you're losing tons of weight, you're gonna re your cholesterol is going to plummet, your blood pressure is going to plummet, and you're going to be a heck of a lot healthier. That's the reason these diets are effective, not because they're not eating meat, in my opinion. All right, um, really quick, a couple more questions. What kind of hard cheeses? I think that's like Parmesan, Asiago, the salty hard ones, the more fermented ones. I'll get back to you on this because I think this is really interesting. But they have to be real cheeses, not the kind of processed cheese that you find at Safeway. You know, go to the real, you know, they have like the fake cheese section and the real cheese section, <laughs> like gourmet cheese. Go to the gourmet cheese section. Okay. Okay, so what do you recommend in regard to eggs, milk, fish, et cetera, free-range organic? Great question. I love this question. So, so first of all, I recommend you read uh, In Defense of Food, I believe is the best one, um, for why it's important that you want chickens that aren't fed a vegetarian diet. You want them running around in the grass eating bugs and eating grains and eating anything they find in the grass. It's going to be your best chickens, pastured. You know, for I guess cage free. Cage free is kind of BS though, because I don't think that's really a benefit. Um, organic is tough because when you're talking about organic animals or animal products, that means that the animals were had to be a fed organic feed, and if they're fed organic feed, then it's industrial organic corn generally. So that's not actually usually better. You're normally going to want to prefer 
pastured or, you know, an animal that's closer to their natural environment. And so Michael Pollan's work covers this stuff awesome. If you haven't read Omnivore's Dilemma or In Defense of Food, those are some of the best books I've ever read in my life. Highly recommend them. Milk. So that's a really interesting one. So we're going to talk about dairy next time. I, I have a lot more research to do on milk. Uh, I've read things that, you know, Colin Campbell from the China study will say milk will kill you. Uh, a lot of people say milk help you lose weight. It's a good source of calcium and vitamin D. Granted, it's not naturally high in vitamin D. It's fortified, so that's kind of BS. Some people swear up and down, left and right, about raw milk, and I think they have very, very good points, which we'll go over next time. However, raw milk is really dangerous. And if you don't believe me, read Bill Marler's blog. It's scary. And people die from this stuff every year because it's not regulated, and it's really hard to keep clean. So... I, I still haven't been brave enough to have any raw milk. I had a couple sips once and I was scared, so I stopped. Fish is tough. Fish is tough because I really believe you need it, and I know that there's a bad overfishing problem, and when you use farmed fish, you are increasing your risk of PCBs, which is this carcinogenic stuff that's in the environment, which is bad, and Mercury is another issue. So I wrote, I wrote a, I kept in the show notes, I have something all about fish, how to choose seafood, and it's very thorough. I wrote it like a year ago. And that, that'll give you a good head start. I, I tend to stick to, and these take some getting used to, but the, the smaller, kind of fishier fish, like sardines, mackerel, these are the highest in omega 3s, the lowest in mercury, and generally the best for the environment because they're small fish. It's the bigger fish, the bigger the fish, the more mercury is collected over its life. And so your tuna, your swordfish, your shark, you know, your large fish, those are going to be the most dangerous in the mercury department, which for a grown man, as long as you're not eating it like 10 times a day, that's probably fine. But if you have a wife who could get pregnant or a baby growing up who's not fully developed, which is under the age of 20, <laughs> you want to avoid those big fish. And so that's my recommendation on fish generally. But read the article. It'll tell you a lot more. The Monterey-based seafood... Uh, advisory they have very good advice on which fish are best uh, or environmentally best does anybody have any more vegetarian or vegan questions yeah it's a, so in terms of so lisa asked here it depends what the animals have been fed that's really true and like i said go read michael pollan it, he'll, it'll really put all this stuff in perspective about why it's important like how the animals were raised and how they were fed and how they were treated and why that's not just important for the animal and for the ethical concerns but for your health and I think that's a really good point. So I think it's about time to wrap up. That was a good conversation. How many of you guys are actually vegetarian and vegan? <laughs> Is there any? Um, so let's let's assume some of you are. So I hope I hope I hope I helped you guys make um, healthy decisions. And I hope that if nothing else, that if you have friends that are vegetarian and vegan and you know, this stuff ever comes up that you at least know, <laughs> none of you are vegetarian, that's great, <laughs> um, that you at least know how to talk to them. And I, I, if you ask me, probably the, you know, I think fish and, I don't know, I still don't know how I feel about animal fat. <laughs> I'm starting to think it's healthy, it's really weird. I'll get back to you on this stuff. I'm reading a lot on this topic. I just, the science is just all over the place and it's confounded so bad by, it, it's so obvious when you read um, studies that people just assume that fat is bad. They, they, it's a given before they even start the study. And, you know, and you, you go look and they tested a high-fat diet. When you go look at the diet they fed them, it was actually really high in sugar and fat. So, you know, I'm, I'm, it's hard to get to the bottom of these questions, but it's fun to try. So... That's it for this week's show. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. Just to remind you, the next live show I scheduled for Monday, April, and it's the first Monday show, which is exciting, um, April 11th at 6.30 p.m. Pacific time, and we will be discussing dairy and milk, uh, friend or foe. So tune in then. I'm going to take this little question down so I can just be big. Woo! And thank you guys so much. Talk to you later.